Uh, now, I'd like to introduce one of our board members, Dustin Hartman, who I think of as a professor of Spanish, although I see and director I, of language. I'm also the uh, assistant professor of Spanish. Okay. <laughs> Uh, who's going to talk on something that, that has very little to do with Spanish, but much to do with our really early history, and that's um, the earthworks that are here in Yellow Springs and, and really in the broader Ohio area. And I think we'll find this really interesting. So, Dawson, now that we've got, <laughs> now that we'll move forward, <laughs> hopefully <fine>. we're, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so welcome. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, this is such a fascinating topic to me. Um, as you can see, this is not my area of research. Uh, this is strictly a personal interest of mine. Uh, my background is in second language acquisition and pedagogy. So I actually first started becoming interested uh, in indigenous cultures because of uh, being in high school in Hilo, Hawaii. And there was a huge program for revitalization of the Hawaiian language. And so I started becoming interested in, well, how is it that it feels like it's under threat to them? How are these uh, impulses of loss, of language, of culture, uh, reiterated in other areas of the US? <laughs> I know, right? There you go. There you go. Well, well, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Pretend it's a large screen. <laughs> okay, so um, what I thought I'd do to sort of situate the local earthworks that we have here in Yellow Springs, within the broader context, uh, archaeologically, historically. So uh, the two earthworks that I'll talk about today in Yellow Springs are um, more or less representative of some of the features of the uh, so-called Adena and Hopewell cultures. Um, however, I'll talk a little bit about uh, that choice for names and how those names came about. <coughs> and then um, the source for most of the mapping that we have and documentation of the original earthworks in Ohio, throughout the Ohio Valley. Uh, and that's from Squire and Davis's Ancient Monuments of the Mississippi Valley, which was conducted uh, in 1847, uh, 1848, published. You can get a copy online at the Library of Congress and through Gutenberg, um, but I'll talk about that. <coughs> um, so what we're finding is that out of the 2,000 or so uh, earthworks at that time, we have only a handful remaining. And um, so that's why I have the, the mission of this talk is to hopefully preserve the ones that we have. Um, so we'll go through uh, the excavations that have been done on the Glen Helen earthworks, both the Orders Mound and the Bell Works enclosure. Uh, and then we'll talk about why there are no uh, indigenous cultures here to defend those <laughs> earthworks anymore and why it is that Squire and Davis did their documentation in the 1840s after <coughs> all of the protectors of those structures had been removed from mm -hmm. the land. So we'll look at the uh, historical events that led up to or preceded uh, the 1830 Indian Removal Act and which of the uh, indigenous cultures of the Ohio Valley were still residing in Ohio at that time. <coughs> and so we're impacted quite seriously by that removal act. And then finally, the conservation effort that is underway now um, to get the Hopewell ceremonial earthworks, and I'll talk about how many of those earthworks are included in this petition, could be protected and recognized under UNESCO's World Heritage Site. So we'll finish with that. Okay, so what time period are we talking about? If you're looking at um, anthropological dating, then we're talking about early woodland period. And the reason that we call that uh, archaeologically uh, terms now Adena, 
So there are two disciplines kind of uh, in conflict about how these uh, cultures should be named. Um, so the problem with calling it Adena is, of course, uh, that this was named after the land, uh, the estate that was owned by uh, Governor Worthington, where a conical burial mound was found, 26 feet high, and that all of the artifacts and the architecture are associated with the funerary practices of these cultures that span throughout southern Ohio uh, and uh, down the Ohio Valley. So it's a little misleading to suggest that there was one culture uh, that left these artifacts behind, left these structures behind. And second, this is not what they called themselves. <laughs> this is what they were labeled uh, when an archaeologist first started investigating these structures. So there's, there's a little conflict there. Um, I will call them early and middle woodland because those are, I think, a little more uh, precise in terms of anthropology. Archaeologists can argue. I'm not an archaeologist. So, <laughs> uh, so but if you want equivalencies more or less, uh, the Adena is associated with early woodland. So that's 800 before the Common Era to 100 Common Era, or BC, AD, if you uh, want the religious terms. Um, so some of the features of these cultures are that this is uh, shifting from the archaic cultures, which were strictly hunter-gatherers and very nomadic, to um, these cultures started planting crops. So they started spending more time in areas so that they could tend their crops. Um, also, really excitingly for archaeologists, they left behind uh, the first clay pottery in Ohio. So uh, they happen to be rather thick walled, uh, not very decorated. Uh, they believe that they were used for grain storage and possibly for cooking. Um, so uh, their funerary practices included burial sites and then either stones or uh, covered with bark, but not timber, which we see in later uh, cultures. And then conical mounds piled up on top of those burials. Uh, so depending on how high they are, uh, we'll see, you know, the largest one in Ohio is the Miamisburg Mound. Uh, that's over 60 feet tall. Um, great view. <laughs> uh, and so there are some that still remain uh, that are much higher. Also, the one in Cedarville at the Indian uh, Mound Reserve. So you can see that one climb up to the top of it. There were originally the belief that all of these earthworks were for defensive purposes. So you'll see some of them misnamed as forts, especially the Hopewell upper uh, hilltop enclosures. Uh, but I'll talk about uh, that a little later because it's so exciting what they discovered uh, some of them are actually used for. Uh, so in any case, we'll start uh, with the um, early woodland and then go on to the middle. Okay, so the Hopewell cultures uh, follow these early woodland. Oh, shoot. I to <laughs> I'm advancing too at the same time. Okay, uh, so the hobo cultures or uh, the middle woodland period um, follows uh, the early woodland. You can see there to the right a little schematic timeline. Uh, so this again was named after the land uh, where a group of mounds were discovered. Uh, in Chillicothe, and the archaeologist uh, Moorhead, who's well known for the excavation of these earthworks in Ohio, uh, first investigated and excavated at this site, so that was 1891. So again, uh, the features that accompany this type of architecture were named for the landowner where these uh, structures were found. Um, so these peoples, uh, constructed the largest scale earthworks in the United States. 
So they're incredibly impressive. Um, they uh, don't know exactly what everything was used for, but there are some speculations. So, um, for example, uh, one of the largest is the Newark Earthworks, and the director of the Center for the Newark Earthworks is also a member of the Potawatomi Nation, and he says that what he would like to uh, inculcate in the people who visit the center is to consider these indigenous peoples as more than just a single facet. So most of what we know about them is through their funerary or burial practices and goods. But that has led to this association with them as uh, one facet. So this stereotype of indigenous peoples as only spiritual. There's this connection to the earth. They have these ceremonial earthworks that are perhaps in some way used for religious or worshipful purposes. And that's all we know of them. And so that's the only facet that seems to persist. However, according to the director of the New York Center, there is a lot of evidence for their skill at, as mathematicians, as civil engineers, um, as astronomers, that they are not given credit for. And in fact, for many decades, these structures were believed to have been built by anything other than the indigenous cultures that lived there to the present day or into the modern period. It had to have been somebody else, including alien visitors. <laughs> so uh, what, what is also hoped is that these indigenous cultures are given credit for everything that they were able to accomplish within a societal and political structure that was largely um, egalitarian. So these works were constructed by these people for their own purposes over decades of time without enslaving their laborers. And that is, I think, really impressive. Okay, so how do we know that there's a connection among early woodland, middle woodland, and then present day, for example, Shawnee? So, what we found uh, in 2008, 2009, University of Cincinnati conducted excavations at uh, Shawnee Lookout Park which included the so-called Miami Fort which turned out not to be a fort at all. So following a period of severe drought, what they discovered is on this hilltop enclosure, which is Hopewell, AKA Middle Woodland in uh, period, uh, is that it's an extensive waterworks that it was built on top of artesian springs. And what they did was they collected the water for drinking and then they uh, traveled, they uh, migrated it to irrigate crops. And so this was a feat of engineering that they have not seen anywhere else before. And it completely uh, undermined the previous uh, idea that this was, these especially hilltop enclosures were specifically for defensive purposes or as a fort. So this is our connection to the present day. And so the argument that perhaps um, they could be included in what happens to their ancestral lands and these earthworks that are their inheritance. Okay, so coming back to Squire and Davis, um, the Bell Works enclosure in the Glen, uh, which is in the South Glen, does appear, it was mapped uh, in this 1847, 1848 publication. Um, so we see uh, in the Green County section, there is um, a drawing depicting the Bell Works. Uh, so I'll talk about that in greater detail. Uh, the Orator's Mound, or what has become the Orator's Mound, originally was a burial mound. There are conflicting reports of whether 
the remains that were found within the orator's mound have been removed or were reinterred after excavation in uh, 71. So according to the last report of excavation that we have, the remains were reinterred. But according to a book that I also have on the mounds of the Ohio Valley, they suggest that those remains were disinterred and that that is why it is no longer considered a burial mound and rather called the orator's mound because it no longer has remains. Not sure uh, what happened to those. I've contacted uh, Dayton Natural History Museum, now Boonshaft. Um, they're not sure. All we have is an account from uh, the 70s where these artifacts at least uh, from the Orator's Mound were on display, on loan from the Dayton uh, Natural History Museum at Trailside Museum. And the Trailside Museum was broken into and all of these artifacts were stolen. Whoa. Yeah. So, yes, not a huge dollar amount, but a tragedy uh, for cultural patrimony. Okay, so what does um, that? <laughs> okay, so starting with uh, the Yellow Spring or the mound near the Yellow Spring, the Orders Mound. So we have a couple of different excavations that have been documented there uh, in the 50s um, by a group of amateur archaeologists from Wright Patterson. They documenting uh, they documented finding some uh, burial remains. And uh, then in 1971, Wolfgang Marshall, uh, a noted anthropologist, archaeologist, who later went on to make a name for himself uh, in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, he was visiting Antioch College uh, at the time in the early 70s. And so this excavation was conducted with archaeology students at uh, Antioch as well. Um, so the publication is Exploration of Glen Helen Mound, published in 1972. There's a copy of it at Antioch College. Um, so what they located was uh, bone fragments and um, dislocated skeletal remains. Um, so therefore, he can uh, say that, well, for sure there were at least four uh, bodies found or burial remains found there, but possibly up to six. Um, they appear to be based on analyses of the skulls, two men, one woman, and a child uh, of indeterminate sex. So what's interesting about this is that mica was overlaid on uh, the bones after decomposition. So there was no flesh left, so they appear to have been part of a funerary rite. Uh, but mica doesn't come from Ohio. And the Hopewell, or the Middle Woodland period, are the ones with the extensive trade routes outside of Ohio. So it's an interesting mix of potentially an Adena mound being in use as the cultural shift crossed from early woodland to middle woodland. And so they retained some of their rights from the earlier culture, but they started using resources that they had from this extensive trade and uh, tribute network uh, that extended to the Atlantic and the Gulf Coasts, to the Appalachians, which is where most of the mica came from, to Illinois as well. So we have seashells, we have mica, we have copper. So extending from Illinois all the way to the Atlantic and then down south to the Gulf Coast. So this is an extensive network uh, that the Middle Woodland uh, artifacts reveal to us. So I think this is a fascinating look at cultures in transition. So the mound, uh, the conical shape and the architecture, the structure, uh, appears to be early woodland. And then there were intrusive burials added later with artifacts that are from the later cultural period. But fascinatingly, there is also um, a tool, uh, an archaic culture point, which was discovered from the period that preceded the early woodland. Hmm. And no one has a really good explanation for that. The thought was that they left tools where they were used, that they didn't carry them. So they're not really sure why this archaic point was found 
um, within this mound, which shows a transition between cultures. Oh. So the next work that we have, the earthwork, uh, is the bell works, and that is enclosure rather than a mound. You can see um, its depiction has been enlarged here on the cover of the excavation report uh, that was conducted by Robert Reardon, uh, archaeology professor, now emeritus, who generously shared the only written copy that we can find. It was left at the Glenn Institute Library, which had flooded during some roof repair. So I tracked him down, and he very kindly gave us a copy to borrow for this presentation, but then we will also be able to leave a copy with Antioch College after this. So it's very exciting. Um, and just incidentally, he also has film footage from the 1950s excavation of the Orator's Mound, which no one knew existed. So that was very exciting. So Dr. Reardon is uh, absolutely beloved right now. <laughs> Okay, so moving on to the Bell Works findings. So, um, unfortunately, uh, from the drawing that you can see there from Squire and Davis from the mid-1800s, there were embankments and two openings in the enclosure. They're estimating. These uh, were not reported, the dimensions of the embankment height, but they were estimating probably about a meter tall. Uh, so this was not a huge enclosure. They do not know what it was used for. There was some speculation that it might have been similar uh, to a, uh, a wood hinge, if you will, with post holes in a circle. Um, there was one in Kentucky that they were thinking that it might be similar to. Uh, if you've been to Fort Ancient, Dr. Reardon's work there has been widely published. Uh, he has become known as a post hole expert <laughs> as a result. <laughs> um, because that wood hinge at Fort Ancient um, had very uh, dark and sterile uh, earth in the middle of it. And upon analysis, was found to have been baked at a high temperature frequently. Hmm. So the theory is that it was a crematory. And um, so funerary practices had changed by the time of the four ancient cultures. <coughs> uh, so in any case, um, there were two post holes for post molds found. And uh, one of them was uh, they collected carbon uh, for carbon dating. Um, and it seemed to be dated to uh, the middle woodland period. So strictly Hopewell, um, but again, they could only excavate a certain portion of it because, uh, as I said, it had been used for agricultural purposes. It had been plowed. Uh, there were also a well line running through it, gas lines cutting through one of the corners. Um, so about 6% of it had been completely obliterated and could not be excavated. So here's what was left. Um, also, interestingly, uh, while there were uh, stone tools, blades, and flaking uh, left as artifacts that were consistent, again, with the carbon dating of the Middle Woodland period, again, there was a stone tool from the archaic culture period. What is going on? Um, so I, I just thought it was so fascinating that they keep saying, oh, well, you know, they don't you reuse the tools or they leave them behind. And then for me, this suggests a significant continuity among these cultures. And so again, I think further evidence for um, the ownership of the indigenous cultures who were here uh, before they were forcibly displaced from their land. So, what happened? <laughs> okay. uh, so, mm -hmm. the 1830 Indian Removal Act, enacted by Andrew Jackson, uh, I think most people associate with the Cherokee Trail of Tears, or that's the best known. Mm -hmm. um, it, there were many, many instances of resistance, of armed battles, 
uh, on the part of the indigenous residents of the land to keep their land from being uh, in, expanded into. So um, really, the Treaty of Greenville uh, in 1795 was sort of the culmination of a series of battles and skirmishes uh, between colonists expanding to the west and the indigenous residents of those lands. So Anthony Wayne, or General Anthony Wayne, is the one uh, who defeated Little Turtle's uh, armies and led to the concession uh, of these lands uh, and this treaty. Tecumseh and his brother took exception and felt that this Indian Confederation, which incorporated many of the cultures at the time, the Delaware, the Miami, Potawatomi, there were a lot of Algonquin speaking uh, groups in this Indian Confederation that was led by Little Turtle at the time. Uh, but Tecumseh and his brother felt that they could not uh, or did not have the authority to concede all of those lands. And so they continued fighting uh, in the Battle of Tip Canoe. We see in 1811 um, Tecumseh's brother, uh, Teng Swatawa, the, or the prophet, um, led uh, his um, warriors into battle. And uh, William Henry Harrison, who was at that time the governor of the Indiana Territory, brought his army and attacked this group uh, of Tecumseh and his brother's allies that they had gathered to resist uh, the further expand expansion of the colonists. Um, there, it wasn't a, a complete massacre. Uh, there were survivors, including Tecumseh and his brother, who fled to Canada but uh, the land was conceded. And uh, then, of course, finally, in the War of 1812, so very shortly thereafter, uh, Tecumseh allies himself and his um, other indigenous cultural allies with the British on the promise that their lands will be returned to them if the British prevail. However, <laughs> in 1830, during the Battle of the Thames, um, the British fled the battlefield entirely and left about 600 warriors uh, under Tecumseh's lead to, to fight completely alone. It was a slaughter. There were several thousand uh, American soldiers in this battle. And so this was essentially the death knell of the <coughs> movement that Tecumseh was leading to try to resist the colonial expansion. So the Treaty of Maumee Rapids, 1817, that was where four million acres of land was ceded to the US government. Uh, some of these. Uh, indigenous cultures had fought on the American side during uh, the War of 1812, and so they were gifted with a few thousand dollars a year uh, in return for all of their land. And uh, the um, three reservations that were in Ohio at that time were in Lewistown, uh, Wapakoneta, and Hog Creek. And then the 1830 Removal Act happened and even those lands were taken away. So who was here when that happened? So these were all of the Ohio uh, indigenous cultures that were present in the 1830s and 1840s, who were uh, forcibly removed. So there are three different tribes of Shawnee depending on where they were located, who they had allied themselves with, uh, and these are the federally recognized tribes. So there were others like the Potawatomi who were not recognized for decades later. Um, so these are the ones that were there, that they have documentation that were there, and where they were moved. Um, as you can see, most of them were removed to Oklahoma, but some to Missouri. Uh, and then those lands were taken away, some to Kansas. 
those lands were significantly reduced. You can go to each of these uh, websites. It's on the website that I'll show you in a minute, uh, the Ancient Ohio Trail, um, where they tell their own histories. So I found that to be very helpful in understanding what that meant to them. And many of them have lists of the treaties that were signed that were then violated by the US government uh, and the lands that they should still be custodians over. which is the State Historical Society, it owns the, uh, the Newark earthworks. And some of these uh, lands have been leased to the Mound Builders Country Club. Uh, and they had a 100-year lease, which then expired, which then was renewed. This is the part I do, I do not follow. Um, so here we are, their lease should, run, should have run out in 2020, 2021, something like that. And <coughs> of course they were fighting uh, the Ohio History Connection, reclaiming their ownership of that land. Um, but one of the requirements uh, of the World Heritage List is that the public must have access to the works. And the Mountain Builders Country Club significantly reduced access to these earthworks. I think it was open to the public twice a year. Mm -hmm. uh, so it really is not the access that is required for inclusion on this list. So. Okay, so if you want to keep up with their progress, the vote by uh, the World Heritage List uh, was delayed because of COVID. So it is now coming up next year, next summer. So they will vote on whether these Hopewell ceremonial earthworks will be included on this list uh, of conservation. Um, so if you are interested, there are things that you can do um, one, of course, is to let your political representatives know how important it is to you that these earthworks are conserved and are preserved for future generations. And, of course, the World Heritage Ohio uh, group would happily take your donations <laughs> toward the effort. Um, but these are the ceremonial earthworks from the Hopewell or Middle um, Woodland eras. Uh, you can see the whole list, so the earthworks at Newark, these are the largest, uh, the most extensive in, in terms of land, uh, over six acres of land, has uh, a, a 
Hopewell era earthwork, but there's also a circle right outside the uh, museum that they think is exhibiting more Adena or early woodland uh, features. It's uh, circular, there's a gateway, and there's a trench dug around the enclosure. And so the idea is that this is potentially uh, where water was poured. Um, there's some mica evidence, so there could also have been fire uh, put in these trenches, and then the mica would reflect that light. Um, they don't know exactly what they were used for, but they assume some ceremonial purpose. Um, and because the later cultures, uh, the Middle Woodland, have, for example, the large octagon, or the great octagon there at Newark, uh, each of the um, sides aligns with the key rise and fall points of the entire moon phase over an 18.6 year period. Mm -hmm. So someone was paying attention and calculating these moon phases because the margin of error for their alignment is even smaller than that of Stonehenge. Hmm. So they were very good astronomers and mathematicians to have created that. Um, but they believe that the Adena mound that is also at this air, uh, in this space was uh, potentially used also in co uh, cooperation with the moon for some reason, but they don't know why. Um, so there's also the four ancient hilltop enclosure, also aligned with moon phases. Uh, they did not know that either. I think it took uh, more than 20, it was like 1980s that they finally put it together <laughs> that these enclosures were aligned with the phases of the moon. I don't know why it took so long. It seems like that is, uh, or an awareness of astronomy and especially of the moon is a common feature in indigenous cultures that you can see throughout South America with the Mayans uh, and up into North America. So I don't know why that didn't uh, occur earlier, but here we are. Um, so anyway, these are on the list. Hopefully we can preserve them so that uh, we don't have more plows or country clubs cutting right through them in the future. Um, one of the fascinating uh, features, not just in terms of the moon phase alignment, is that uh, the soil that was used was carried from various distances away from these earthworks. So uh, the art installation that I was visiting in Newark when um, the director was talking about how they were constructed was that they are strata within the embankment walls that represent different areas uh, that were potentially part of these cultures' domains. Mm. So I thought, oh, that's really cool. They're representing <laughs> everybody in their ceremonial works. Um, but also, the art installation that they were um, uh, exhibiting at the time were basket weaving artifacts. So. Also, the present day, right, the Smithsonian Institute, or uh, Museum for uh, Native American um, Culture and History, they have one of the baskets that was woven by a present day basket weaver and master of the craft, um, who is Potawatomi. So these practices are still in use. So uh, I think it's also important to not consider uh, the kind of erasure or genocidal tendencies uh, that were um, visited upon these cultures as something of an artifact of the past either. Mm -hmm. It is quite present day. So thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Where, yes. where, are those, where are those last two on the bottom line there? Uh, the Fort Ancient Hilltop <coughs> Enclosure. And then uh, the Hopewell Culture National Historical Park. Uh, so that's the Chillicothe, the, the Mound Group, Mound City, Sig Earthworks, the Hopeton Earthworks, and that's the High Bay Earthworks. Where is that? Hopeton, those are all Chillicothe. And how about the High Bank? 
Um, I thought they were all part of the Hopewell Cultural National Historical Park. So I believe they're all in the same area. But I could Flint, be wrong. Flint Ridge oh. over there. It's not included in this, but it obviously served an incredibly important purpose because not only during the Hopewell period do we see artifacts from that extensive trade network coming to Ohio, but we see Flint from Ohio in all of those places as well. And so that was traded. Mm -hmm. I think High Bank, as you go along beyond Chillicothe, is where High Bank Farm is. Oh. And I think that may be where. Okay. I'm not sure on that. Okay. Yeah, because I know the there. Mound City and um, the main uh, Hopewell Mound group is enormous. Mm -hmm. It covers acres of land. Um, so these were considered to be part of the same ceremonial group, but obviously they may extend beyond the Chillicothe incorporated borders that we have today. Yeah? I thought it was uh, funny, but I think it goes to the point about what were the, some of these really used for. There was a book that was published, I don't know, 20 years ago called Motel of the Mysteries, and it was about archaeologists a thousand years from now excavating a, um, a motel, a roadside motel, <laughs> and trying to interpret what it was used for, including the, uh, they have a drawing of, of the chieftain in his headdress, which was a uh, toilet seat, so he's sticking his head up with the, with the, uh, the seat cover sticking up behind him. So it, it, it takes a while to try to figure out what they actually were used for. It's true, I mean, and the farther back you go, the less that remains of their of their living practices, we have more of their funerary practices. But then, what does that tell us about how they lived? Not a whole lot. Um, so yeah, it, is, it does lead to some very interesting speculation. <laughs> but these, uh, at least the foreign ancient, was still in use. There were peoples that came uh, every year for various ceremonies um, until they were removed from the land. So they were in continuous use. And um, the, the ones uh, west of Cincinnati, um, the Shawnee Lookout Park, where the fort uh, was that's actually a waterworks, um, that, they believe, is the longest continuously occupied um, Native American enclosure in the United States. Mm -hmm. Yes? I was wondering if you have uh, any ideas about the type of coverings that were on the uh, conical mounds around here. I've heard speculation from Georgia that sometimes they were plastered over because they didn't have cool season grasses here. They weren't native grasses. And, uh, oh, wow. No, I have no idea about that. And but I would hard love, it if would you be find to, a preference, please. <laughs> how hard it would be to maintain a treeless mm -hmm. conical mound mm -hmm. at the time. I mean, there was speculation about uh, the area around the Orders Mound and the Glen that seemed to have been kept open by some of the same practices that were used at Fort Ancient, uh, which was banding trees uh, to make sure that they were open plains so that the enclosures uh, were kept separate from, from the trees there. And the Adena Mound in the Glen seems to have some of that. They're either very young trees or very old trees. So that suggests that there is a period of time between the two that it was kept open space for ceremonial purposes. Mm -hmm. You know what the purpose of the Serpent Mound? There's a really cool video <laughs> on that website. So if you go under uh, the four educators section, um, there is, oh, I think he is currently the Cherokee Nation uh, chief, Frank, yeah, and now his name is ex escaping me, um, but he talks about what he thought uh, the serpent effigy mound uh, was related to in their present day practices. And he was saying that there are seven curves to the serpent, and that number seven is very significant in their culture. And so the idea was that it was uh, kind of like a, a serpent's uh, ladder to enlightenment, 
and that there were certain uh, skills or abilities that you needed to demonstrate at each of the curves until you could arrive at the head of enlightenment. But he can't say if that's what they did before, but the effigy mounds tend to be a little later. Uh, so the later Hopewell period or the later middle woodland period. And there's, you know, we've got the alligator, we've got the serpent mound. Um, there are a lot of effigy mounds. Uh, in our area that are visible. So um, that's kind of, I mean, we're, we're right in the center of all of that cultural production. So uh, I really hope we get to you know, enjoy those and learn from them for, for many years to come. Well, yeah. About the Serpent Mound, there's a really good book. It's not in print anymore. It's called Cry of the Ancients by Little Pigeon and Gray Wolf. And they descended from what was called the Serpent Clan. And they, she talks about, and, well, he, he died a long time ago. And I think she's dead now, too. But uh, it's not in print, but I got one. I think it's uh, a little bookstore I went to in North Carolina. She told me about the uh, bibliograph or something like that, dot com, where you can find all these books out of print. Ooh. It only costs like 10 bucks. Oh, that's great. And it, it, she, I forget what, how she explained it, but it's just serpent mounds up for ceremony. Mm. You know, for years, people thought it was burial. No, there's no, there's no, yeah. there's no bones. They are not burial mounds. No, no. 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 Mm -hmm. It's a really good book up there. Woo! And in, in the book, this is going way back. Uh, she tells it because everything in Native America, I guess, was hand-me-down stories. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Right about it. That in the early 1800s, a farmer in the Newark area was plowing the field and hit something, and he dug it up, and it was uh, wrapped in something, but it was papyrus. And it was in Hebrew. And there is theories that some of the Native American tribes were the one lost tribes of Israel. <laughs> it's, in, it's in this book. It's cool. Uh huh. And that that a person that looks like Jesus appeared to the Native Americans thousands of years ago. Hmm. As a representative of one of the Jewish tribes. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Pride 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 yeah, so there, there are lots of theories, not a whole lot of evidence uh, for what they were used for other than ceremonial purposes. Um, so yeah, the ar archeological evidence is scant um, and some of them are lost completely. Mm -hmm. I was thinking that when we were at the Newark works, one of the people was talking about um, because of the way there were the earthworks that block view into these huge circular areas um, that they may even have been public marketplaces to keep thieves out. Do you know what I mean? That you couldn't just see who was in there until you'd been given permission and that there were watchtowers. Mm -hmm. And that it wasn't defensive, that it was commercial. It was, and protective. <laughs> exactly, protective and commercial. <laughs> Yeah, also possible. Like, mm -hmm. They know that people were gathering there right. uh, into uh, the modern period. And they gather for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I missed about the bell works in the South Glen. Is it something that we can see, or is it just the post molds? Yeah, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, there is nothing left to see. Plowing. Yeah, it, it's been plowed under, um, and the post molds were found only by excavating down uh, under the tilled soil layer, uh, and then they found them, and they found them by the rock formations that are there to hold the posts in place and so that's how they discovered that they were there but they went looking for them mm -hmm. so that's how they found them because it, they thought it was going to be an enclosure with posts all the way around but they could only find two in the part they excavated and then they went another 1.8 meters to each side and there were no post holes so yeah uh -huh. Are there any other mounds other than the one in and uh, Cedarville and Miamisburg? Are there any other ones around of that, of that size? Not of that. So the early woodland period, the Adena, the Miamisburg one is the highest. But there are a whole lot of others throughout Ohio. Um, so our uh, little baby mound, which actually originally was five meters tall, excavation has shrunk it. Um, 
And that's what happened actually at the Miamisburg mound is they started to excavate and it dropped two feet. Oh. And so they stopped the excavation process. Mm -hmm. And now they have less invasive techniques like LIDAR mm -hmm. uh, where they can look inside uh, of, the, of the mounds without excavating them. Um, so they have been using that more. The one in Cedarville, for example, that's how they found where the burial remains oh. were in okay. that one was using LIDAR. Um, and they tend to be burial remains not dug into the earth but laid on top of the earth and then the cone uh, shape over on top of them. So there are a whole lot of them. In fact, uh, I have a book. <laughs> So if you're interested, Dark Star Books happens to have this, uh, Indian Mounds of the Middle Ohio Valley, and it has an accounting of the ones that are left now uh, that are preserved and that you can visit. So you can find them here. Yeah. <laughs> Go Dark <Donna> Star. <laughs> when is Newark next going to be open to the public? <laughs> I know, there is, there's usually an October date. Uh, like mid October, uh, but it should be on their website when it opens up. There's one in the spring, one in the fall. <laughs> so I, I don't know the status of when they will cede uh, ownership of the country club there, but it would be well well worth preserving because there are uh, golf uh, yeah, carts. Yes, golf cart tracks through through the middle of some of the embankments. Oh. How could you do that? Um, but they claim that they have preserved them because they take such good care of the grounds. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> yes, thank you. Right, there's a, an Eden, uh, Adena mound as well, or early woodland period, uh, in the middle of a residential area, but also quite bikeable. Um, and that's, uh, oh gosh, that's about the same height as the one in the Cedarville Indian Mound Reserve. Um, and it's quite intact. Well, yeah? Jumping forward into the historical period, tell us about what you know about the state park under construction at Old Town. Oh, wouldn't that be great? Yes, yeah, so I uh, do not know all of the details about it, but I do know that their mission was to preserve uh, Old Tilcotha, where uh, Tecumseh spent childhood time. Um, so that was one of their seasonal encampments uh, for that um, indigenous culture. Uh, again, Shawnee. Uh, so hopefully they will share the artifacts that have been excavated along uh, the, the riverside uh, where they had their, um, their hunting encampment. I believe it was the summer one that they had there. Um, so hopefully that will be preserved. If the, plot of land looks so tiny now that they've cleared it for, for the museum. But the, the state is committed to uh, putting that up and to protecting Old Chilicotha. So hopefully um, that will be well funded <laughs> and possible soon so that we can visit. But I don't know what, uh, what they're going to have accessible on the site itself or if it will be protected as an archaeological site. Uh, and then there'll be visitation and, and uh, instruction in the museum itself. So I don't know what their timeline is, but I know that that was their mission in purchasing the land. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, what types of protection exist for these various uh, archaic uh, sites at this time in Ohio or the U.S. The world? Yeah, really not enough. I mean, if they have been protected as a park, then they have some, uh, some protection. But a lot of them don't have that protection. So there's no broad uh, mandate to preserve? Not that I know, not that I know of. Someone with conservation background for land should, should <laughs> be contacted about that. Uh, because there's, a, there's one in Xenia just at the end of a cul-de-sac in a residential area that's very small that you can, can go visit. But as far as I know, it's not protected. Um, and 
you know, that, that unfortunately is what happened to the Bell Works enclosure, uh, is that it, it was not protected, it was private land. And so it was used as agricultural land. So it's no longer available to us. Well, I'm thinking uh, various municipalities protect things of value in their community. Mm -hmm. Is there anything like that in the state of Ohio? I don't know. No. I don't know. But that would be uh, a really good question. All I know is that the ones that are preserved are in some park. And that's the only uh, process that I know of that has successfully protected them. But there could be other uh, avenues available for their protection. So that would be a really, a really good question. Again, we'll take, we'll take that up. <laughs> yeah. Is there any effort by the National Park Service to do anything with these mm. areas? That's a really good question. I know. Are Diane would be anything? able to answer that one, right? Does I she don't, know? I don't if there's know there's anything? That, I don't know what she knows about that. Oh. Yeah, yeah that would be a, a great question. Is okay, once it's a park. Yeah. Fine, but how are they protected within the Park Service? Because as we know, park lands are not necessarily sacrosanct. <clears throat> they can be drilled. They, you can do hunting. You can do a lot of things you wouldn't think would be possible in park lands. Um, so yeah, that's a really good question. If the Park Service even has an instrument to protect, you know, uh, culturally significant uh, well, they structures. They do in other areas. Uh -huh. So, <laughs> yeah, so again, I know, the now we've got like two or three different things we have to research in the historical <laughs> society. <laughs> the cultural center in, in uh, Tillicothe is a national park. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I'm not sure okay. what they're doing. So that's national rather than right. municipal. Okay. Right. All right. So yeah, that is possible. I was possible. of the opinion that you know, the, the Native Americans were called Hopewell, and just like you had said, it was named after the farmer that owned the land. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Nobody knows what their names were. Right. And, it, and it's a whole multiplicity of communities that pass through and use those lands. So, uh, so that's why they, you know, haven't uh, decided to say, oh, well, this, these were Shawnee and exclusively Shawnee. It's like, no. You know, all these uh, cultures within the Ohio Valley and, uh, and south into Kentucky and, you know, west and Indiana, they all traveled through these areas and used uh, these lands and left behind artifacts. And so, you know, you could say, oh, well, they've been grouped linguistically, you know, the Algonquin speaking uh, groups, but they were also forced into alliances <laughs> uh, by expansion. And so, you know, we don't really know uh, because those cross linguistic lines, like the Seneca who left the Algonquins and then joined the Shawnee in order to have a reservation, um, that happens. Uh, so anyway, sorry, I'll, I'll bring this to a close. <laughs> and if you have any further questions, feel free to come up. I'll share my, uh, my references. Oh, yes, one last one. Uh, do you have any information on ley lines? No, but that's another fascinating area. I know, that would be really, yeah. Well, coming at a geological perspective, right? Instead yeah. of archeological, yeah. So no. Also not a geologist, very sorry, <laughs> but I love that question. Okay, I can tell you what, they're kind of rotating about three feet in diameter, <laughs> and they're running between mounds, between uh, Enon, Cedarville, and Mount Amesburg, and you can detect them if you're a well wisher. Ah, so with the dowsing rods, there's some electromagnetic they can, and activity. Once their surfaces don't make any difference. Mm -hmm. And the Cedarville Mountain supposedly has about 30 of them coming out of them in various directions. Hmm. Oh my gosh. So, yeah, something else to monitor with the instrumentation that we may have at our disposal. So, anyway, without further ado, thank you again for coming.